I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors of the podcast, Sierra Pacific Windows, who when they reached out to me recently, I was glad to say yes, because we at Building Culture use their windows on about 90% of our projects. The whole team loves them. Uh, and really thankful to have them sponsoring the podcast. I also want to thank one source windows who if you are in the state of Oklahoma, it doesn't just matter about the window manufacturer, but also about the distributor and the installer and the people you're working with. And we've used one source windows uh, who sells Sierra Pacific and several other great lines um, for also about 90% of our projects. All right, on to the podcast. The most profitable products in the entire food system are the ones that are also the worst for people. I don't think that anyone can reasonably look at the rates of chronic disease and conclude that we have a regulatory body that is doing an ex exceptional job of protecting Americans today. Like if you ask me, I think the FDA is like responsible for more American deaths than like almost any war that the U.S. has ever engaged in. This week's guest is Justin Mayers. Over the past decade, Justin has founded three health brands, Kettle and Fire, Perfect Keto, and Surely Non-Alcoholic Wine, which do tens of millions in revenue. You can find Kettle and Fire, really high quality bone broth, taking up whole shelves at Whole Foods or Sprouts. You've probably seen it if you shop at any of those places. Um, he's a really impressive person, and I just love what he's doing and how he thinks. Today, you will learn about how profoundly broken our food and health systems are, which is fairly depressing, to be honest. But at the same time, we have to recognize and articulate the problems before we can actually solve them. And there's also a lot of hope because we have people like Justin working on just these things and many others um, working on these problems. And, and my goal today is to arm you with information. If you are wondering why I'm talking about food on a building podcast, it's because our mission at Building Culture is to facilitate human flourishing, specifically through the built environment. But health is utterly essential to human flourishing. It's a prerequisite. It doesn't matter how beautiful the architecture, how perfectly arranged the buildings are, if we aren't healthy. And as you will see, we are very, very sick. Um, and you'll actually also see a lot of correlations between the food and health industry and the building industry that we often talk about here at Building Culture. Um, I'll put resources in the show notes, but be sure to follow Justin's monthly Substack, The Next, where he puts out some really helpful and actu actionable information. I'm always pulling new products and tips from him. Um, and today I'm posting part one and we'll drop part two next week. My name is Austin Tunnell, and this is the Building Culture Podcast. Justin, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. I'm really excited to talk to you today. Yeah, super excited to be here, man. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. Um, you know, I want to start, it was funny because, uh, you know, you've been on the schedule for a little bit to, to record this, but I was reading, I'd been hearing Noah Kagan's name for a while. And I think you brought it up in the newsletter. You just like name dropped him. And so I decided to actually just buy his book, you know, million dollar weekend. And as I was reading it over a weekend, I don't know, a few weeks ago, I was like, Justin Mars in one of the chapters, like former intern there. And then how you started kettle and fire with just a landing page. And I think without a product. And then you also mentioned it's a $100 million company now, which I was blown away by that. I didn't realize that, but although it makes sense when I see it all in the grocery store. But uh, to start off with, could you, could you just talk a little bit about um, how you started? You know, that was your first company, how, how Kettle and Fire started um, and, and where it is now. Yeah, for sure. I mean, so, so Noah was... Yeah, so Noah, I worked with Noah for a little bit when I was in college, basically. Uh, you know, I was, I was, uh, working with him on AppSumo. I built like one of the early courses that he was selling called the mint marketing course. And, you know, that, that was sort of my like internship in a way. Uh, and then, you know, Noah asked, asked me if I wanted to work with him after I graduated. And I said, no, um, not because he's bad, just because, you know, I, I had a different opportunity I wanted to pursue, but, um, but basically like working with Noah and like one of the things that he talks a lot about, uh, a friend, Sam Parr also talks a lot about was this idea of just like testing, uh, testing specific business ideas by putting up a landing page that describes the thing that you're going to sell and then sending it to friends or buying paid ads or, you know, with some way getting traffic towards that thing and just seeing like, if I spend $2 on a click that then goes to this landing page to potentially buy this product, do people convert? Because, you know, for, for the average person, they don't know. And you kind of assume if you're clicking on an ad that drives you to buy something, you sort of assume that that is a, you know, that, that, that product actually exists. Like there are very few pages on the internet that are selling something that doesn't exa actually exist. And so 
I, I kind of took that that way of thinking and that methodology um, and applied it to one of my very early ideas I had, which was in 2015, I was doing CrossFit in San Francisco. Uh, I had a bunch of friends that were getting injured and talking about like how to you, you know get recovery. Um, my brother had also like torn basically everything that he could tear in his knee playing soccer and was bedridden for like eight weeks. And he was like, hey, what can I do to help improve my recovery? I mentioned bone broth. And when I went online, like literally no one at the time, this was 2015, was selling any sort of product that was like made with grass fed bones, you know, organic ingredients, like all the things that I thought were really important in a, a really good bone broth product. And so I had this small idea and I was like, you know, I'm sort of looking for my next thing. I wanted to start a company, did not think it would be a bone broth company. I thought it would be like a big tech company. You know, I was living in San Francisco, drinking the Kool-Aid hardcore. And so I, I was just decided I'm going to put up a landing page that says we're selling bone broth using grass fed bones, whatever. Uh, do people want to buy this? And, you know, after spending $500 on ads or so, we fake sold about $2,000 worth of product. And you and, had no product. Yeah, with, with no product. <laughs> and like, the, uh, like, I literally paid someone $5 on Fiverr to put together a little logo, bought the domain Bone Broths Co., Bone Broth with an S dot, dot com. Um, so it was bonebroths.com and the company was Bone Broths Co. Horrible naming. I mean, you could tell it was just like, in retrospect, just so slapped together and like, you know, uh, and, and sold these products for $30 a pop. And every time that someone bought one, I would just email them and say like, hey, product's not ready. We're probably like six to eight months away from, from actually launching it. Uh, if you want, I can like refund you in full or, uh, you know, I'll give you half off and we'll like ship it to you once you actually, you know, once we actually launch it. Uh, and a shocking number of those people are like, sure, like I'll take 50% off. And then they would answer my questions about like, why do you care about this product? What do you want? What's your sort of customer profile? What problem is this solving for you? And so it was this really amazing way to not only validate the idea that I had, but also as to like start a conversation with a bunch of customers that, um, you know, that I found out were, were like really interested in what we had to sell. So that, that was sort of the genesis of, of Kettle and Fire. Man, that is really cool. Uh, that, that's what I, you know, I loved what Noah talks about in his book, kind of the main thing that I, I kind of see is he, he talks very long and like how everything in business is an experiment because you just don't know yeah. You don't know until you try. You don't know what people are going to want, what people are going to buy. Um, but that is <laughs> that, that takes some um, some courage to do that. I think I think I would have had a hard time putting up a landing page without a product. I love that story. That's really cool. Yeah. And and so since 2015, and that's amazing. That's when I started drinking, making bone broth myself was uh, 2015. Yeah, you there know, were no good options. Added, so you were aware. Fed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, can you talk a little bit, just people listening, like what is the difference between like say bone broth and, and just regular old chicken broth? For sure. Yeah. So, so normal chicken broth that you find at the store, um, you know, if you look at the bet on the label, it's basically going to be low protein. They use very like low cook times. So two ish hours, uh, they're often throwing like garbage cuts of meat into water, basically boiling it for a brief period of time. And then a bunch of, add a bunch of salt and you have this like zero nutrition, somewhat meat flavored water that people like drink. Bone broth is a little different in that you're throwing, um, you know, bones and the cartilage that are that are attached to those bones, sometimes like chicken feet, or other sort of gelatinous, uh, you know, cuts, um, or joint tissue or whatever, into something you're cooking it for over 24 hours, in almost every case, uh, you're adding an acid to help break down the cartilage in the bones. And, you know, what what's left is this very nutrient dense, very high protein, very high in like uh, type one, type two collagen, uh, full spectrum amino acids, and the like. Uh, bone broth that actually has a bunch of nutritional benefits. Like if you look at the average American's diet, you know most people are eating cuts of muscle meat, um, you know ground beef, steaks, things like that, um, chicken breasts that are high in protein, but that don't actually have a, a full spectrum of amino acids, glycine. Um, you know, being like one of the main ones, collagen being another, that the skin basically and uh, your skin and, and body needs to turn protein into uh, gut, skin, and joint sort of tissue. And so, what what bone broth is is, in my opinion, like one of the most nutrient dense sort of uh, helpful things that you can have if you're trying to improve your gut, skin, or joint health. Uh, and there's a reason that like bone broth has been used like truly every culture basically ever that eats meat 
has some history of making bone broth of some sort of like cooking or boiling, you know, bones and connective tissue for long periods of time and then drinking that because it's just so nutrient dense. Yeah. And it's a way to use up every, you know, kind of bit of the animal. I remember we actually made some chicken foot <laughs> bone yeah. broth sometimes and it was so gelatinous. It's like jello when it gets cold, you know. Yeah, it's, uh, exactly. But we drink the kettle on fire now. I mean, because we were just sick a couple of weeks ago, like with a stomach bug and my wife, like the only thing she could take down was the chicken broth. But like we get kettle on fire because, yeah, it's got 19 grams of protein in this little box. Yeah. You look at, it's like two grams or something in, in a regular yeah. uh, chicken broth. So it's really cool. That's awesome. I'm glad you and your wife liked it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, we, we've kind of did it for, uh, you know, let, joint stuff is great, but really the gut issues and things. Cause like I mentioned right before we hopped on, when we got back from the Peace Corps, we spent two years in Uganda and man, I mean, so many parasites, worms, stuff like that in our stomach. I mean, I was like pretty, pretty dang sick and kind of went on some gaps diet and doing fermented food and kombucha and, and bone broth and stuff. So, yeah. Um, you know, you, you talk about, uh, I was on your website, uh, the bone, the kettle on fire website the other day and, and just looking at the little intro story that you, you do in a video. And there's a few things that you said that really stuck out to me. You talk about how you guys are investing in a food system that makes people healthier rather than sicker. Um, and that it's not just about our products. Our current food system is broken. We wanted to create products to heal. And then lastly, uh, supporting people on their path, path to improved health and wellness and supporting and elevating a healthier food system. You know, where did you, where did you get all these ideas? Are those things you already kind of went in in 2015 when you were starting this? Or is it something that, that kind of evolved as you started diving in and learning more about the food system and health? You know, what is that with evolution of that story? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely not a set of things that I just like came into the space with. I would say that I started, I mean, like I said, I started this company uh, because I was in health, I was doing CrossFit, I was like reading about this stuff on the side. Um, you know, there was definitely an intellectual interest there. But by no means was I, did I have this like fully robust, well developed philosophy of how messed up the food system is and how like Kettle and Fire was there to change it. Like I, I basically, came up with the idea, I tested it, it tested well, and I kind of ran with it from there. Um, but as I got more and more into building the company, as I met more and more influencers and sort of people that are knowledgeable about the state of health and the state of our food system, and as I just read more, saw the incentives that exist, looked like did competitive research on, on what other companies are doing, I just became more, it became more and more clear to me that if you engage in the food system, if you look at companies in the food system, it is irrefutable that the most profitable products in the entire food system are the ones that are also the worst for people. Like Coca-Cola is cheaper than water, not because you know adding a bunch of other stuff to water it makes it cheap, but because um, Coca-Cola is benefiting from massive numbers of um, subsidies around you know high fructose corn and thus high fructose corn syrup. Uh, they have huge amounts of uh, capex infrastructure and distribution infrastructure that they can benefit from, and all of this leads to a a sort of like a food product or a food like product that has been engineered that has had literally like hundreds of millions of dollars have gone into figuring out how do we make coke as cheap as water and a thousand times more addictive and this is true across every aspect of the food system practically where almost everything that you see in a grocery store that is like prepackaged has been you know has tens of hundreds of millions of dollars of food scientists that are figuring out how do we weaponize this food and make it so that your little limbic system, like your sort of mammalian brain goes, Ooh, this is sweet. I want more. Or in the case of a Dorito, like, wow, there's a little bit of fat, uh, but it sort of like finishes at the back of the tongue. And so people actually want more of this. And it's like hard to stop eating Doritos once you start. All that to say, like, as I just got more and more into understanding, like what big food companies are doing and, um, you know, how they're engineering these hyper addictive products, uh, it just became more and more clear to me that most companies and most most of the the large companies that manufacture, you know, almost every bit of the processed like calories that Americans eat today, they're not necessarily creating products that are healthier for people by any means. Like very much the opposite. And I think that starting running and and growing a company that actually is trying to do right by consumers, that is trying not to make trade offs um, that that end up harming consumers and impacting their health in a negative way is both very important. It's also very hard. Like it's taken us many years to, to get to some sort of scale and like building a food company is really tough. There's like a lot of, a lot of challenges in this space. 
Uh, but yeah, so it was something that I, I certainly figured out and began to believe more and more as I got deeper into the space. And as I just started to see that all of these big companies got rewarded, the more that they tried to addict Americans and play to sort of like our interests or our, our sort of inherent desires for salt, sugar, you know, and fat. I'd like to take one minute to talk about our sponsors a little bit more. Sierra Pacific Windows. So I mentioned that we use them at Building Culture on about 90% of our projects. And one of the main uh, products we use from them is their H3 casement window. And their H3 is an aluminum clad window. We love casements that actually kind of open up rather than double hung that slide up and down because you really get the whole window that opens up. And what I love about the H3 is that they're aluminum clad, but they're, they're a great price. And comparable brands at that price point that are also aluminum clad. Yeah, a lot of people make good windows, but what sets Sierra Pacific apart in my mind is the range of options. And I think they've got something like 27 colors and they just released some more in that price point. They've got all sorts of different profiles we use and we always use the 5.8s or almost always use the 5.8s putty profile. In other window manufacturers, you have to jump up to the more expensive models and spend double on the windows to get those same options. So that is one of the reasons that we love Sierra Pacific windows. I also want to thank one source windows. So it doesn't just matter the window manufacturer. It, manu it matters who you buy your windows from, the distributor, because they're the ones that put together the package with you, walk you through all the details. You're basically building all these custom windows from scratch, and there's a lot of work that goes into that. They're also the ones installing it. They're also the ones warranting it, the people you're gonna call if something's going wrong. And so having someone that you trust is really important, uh, especially around windows, which are one of the most expensive components that go into a house. And like I said, we've used one source for about 90% of our projects in Oklahoma. So or if you are in the state of Oklahoma, I highly recommend you check out One Source Windows, who also sells Sierra Pacific. And you can go to onesourcewindows.com. And I forgot to mention, but Sierra Pacific, you can go to sierrapacificwindows.com. Thanks. Yeah. And now you're you're on to uh, you've started also surely like non alcoholic wines and perfect keto too right those are two of the other companies you yeah. have started and kind of a similar philosophy right like where you're trying to deliver you know a, a quality healthy food you know and, and I love how you talk about it even where it's like comes down to even the packaging and stuff too like everything about it because there's so many broken elements along the way whether it's how the cows are raised you know you mentioned grass fed you know and the difference I, I remember learning you know reading Michael Pollan's book and I think I'm quoting this right but that when you feed cows corn as we all do in the United States uh you know there there are rumens that can actually digest the the grass are neutral pH but when you feed them corn that turns them acidic and then that acid eats through the rumen or the, the the stomach lining basically spills out you know that bacteria into the bloodstream and that's why then you have to give them antibiotics and you're just like oh my gosh you know um and we have no idea as Americans because we're so detached from the food system. And also, uh, I, we've really been relying on experts for a long time. And like the idea of companies doing the right thing, and that, you know, the FDA and these other regulatory bodies are protecting the consumer, but it really seems like they are not. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're absolutely not. Like, <laughs> but, like, I, I don't think that anyone can reasonably look at the rates of chronic disease. And like, you know, most of which is, in my opinion, like a foodborne illness. Uh, and conclude that we have a regulatory body that is doing an ex exceptional job of protecting Americans today. Like if you ask me, I think the FDA is like responsible for more American deaths than like almost any war that the U.S. has ever engaged in. Uh, and, and I think that's actually a fact. Right. Can, can you talk about that? Because I, I don't know as much in this space, nearly as much as, as you do, but that's kind of my general consensus as well. But at the same time, it's like you've got so many doctors and stuff out there would call that a, I don't know, like, it sounds like a conspiracy theorist, right? When you start saying this kind of stuff and, and, and then people are going, well, well, you're not a doctor, Justin, you're not a doctor, Austin. How dare you speak on behalf of the science? Can you talk about that kind of like regulatory capture and like the state of the, why are you saying that? Yeah. And so uh, like to your, to your last point, like, you know, Justin, uh, or Austin, you're not a doctor. Like if you, if you look, it's, it's very like well-known that uh, 80% of medical schools in the country require zero nutrition classes. 
uh, almost all medical school in the US, um, almost all medical schools are funded by pharmaceutical companies or these sorts of companies that, you know, you, we can argue about intent or whatnot, but, you know, the, the sort of standard of care, the way that medical schools teach our potential doctors and the way that these doctors and these, these institutions of learning are funded are by companies who look at something, look at an individual, uh, not as like a person with who may be experiencing a symptom, but like if I have throat cancer, they're looking at me as a throat that may be inflamed. And like, they're not interested in, you know, how do I treat this whole person? What could possibly be um, lifestyle or other sort of factors that are leading the throat cancer? They're like, how do I either have a surgery or, you know, give you a pharmaceutical that treats this little part of the, of this human that I'm seeing. Um, and, and so when people are like, you know, you're not a doctor, uh, it, you know, what, how could you possibly have opinions on the FDA and nutrition? I'm like, yeah, thank God I'm not a doctor. I've like actually read books on nutrition and stuff like this. Whereas like none of, many of these people have not. Um, that not all doctors are bad, obviously, but I think that's like one rebuttal to that. Uh, the, on the like macro picture, um, around the FDA and regulatory, something that has stuck with me is I once read about, um, how cars versus planes are regulated. And so the, basically like the EU, I promise this is connecting back to the, the answer, but basically if you look at how cars are regulated, um, the like cars are, are regulated in a way where uh, there, there, there are guidelines given around that are saying like, if X, Y, or Z happens, if like a part is defunct or whatever, um, you know, it's on you, the car maker to follow like this set of rules. And if something violates that you can do this massive recall that comes at great expense to you, you know, um, as a car maker or whatever. And the reason for this is because it kind of makes sense. Like the, the average consumer benefits way more from having cars getting cheaper uh, being able to you know travel longer distances, cars get safer on their own through like competition mechanisms, and the the regulatory bodies are sort of like we're going to let the car makers innovate at a faster pace that is not gated by us at every at every you know step of the way. However, if someone like missteps or goes around our guidelines, they basically have to go through this huge recall process at their own expense. Um, and then this has happened like many times in history. The most famous being like the Ford Pinto. Um, airlines are regulated a different way which is that the FAA basically has to like approve every single step of, um, of aircraft uh, as, as like a new aircraft is being built. The reason for this is because in the case of failure, that failure is like massively catastrophic. Uh, you know, it does mean that there's not like competitive forces that are making air travel necessarily hugely cheaper. You know, air travel has been pretty expensive and stayed about that for the last 30 to 40 years. But we have had very, very near zero, um, you know, crashes and the like, because the FAA takes safety very seriously, because the consequences of not doing so are very severe. Um, the way that our, that Europe regulates from a food system standpoint, looks a lot more like aircraft manufacturing, where they basically go, there's a very narrow band of chemicals that we know are safe for human consumption. Um, and we're going to allow food manufacturers to use those uh, when they make like our different foodstuffs. And anything outside of that, there's a huge burden of proof for a food manufacturer or other to say like, hey, we want to introduce uh, Red 40 or something like this, you know, a food dye that, that has like never been well tested across, you know, tens of hundreds of thousands of people um, in terms of like what that does to, to health. And so the EU is like, no food dyes. We don't have any, believe, any reason to believe that this is safe by default. The US sort of regulates food by... Um, in a way that like car manufacturers do, which is they basically say, if you can prove something that say, you know, you manufacturer can attest that something is generally recognized as safe, which means that you basically do a couple of studies and you just say like, Hey, this seems safe. We can't really see if there's like any, uh, really bad shit that comes from introducing red dye or red 40 to a bunch of our food products. The FDA is like, sure, whatever, throw it in every food everywhere. And what you what that means is that practically, you know, there there's like sixteen thousand chemicals that are in our food supply in the U.S. that are banned in Europe today, and sixteen thousand, yeah, like ten, you know, tens of thousands of chemicals that are allowed in the U.S. by default that are banned in Europe. It's why, and it's why you see, in my opinion, massively different health outcomes uh, among Americans versus Europe. Like if you look even at Kellogg's cereal, for example, uh, the European version of Kellogg's cereal doesn't have like fake food dyes and all of this sort of bullshit that is in the American version. Why? It's because like the EU doesn't allow it. 
And also there's now tons of studies that show, you know, that the Kellogg's definitively knows that including red 40 and whatever in a bunch of their cereals leads to worth, worse consumer health outcomes. However, it's like slightly cheaper for them to do so. Um, you know, the food looks more eye popping and appealing and the like. And so they keep it in their product and like, you know, Americans eat it all the time and become sick. Like, I, I think that this is the last thing I'll say, but I think that one of the biggest issues in the country with how we approach, uh, with how we approach like regulating what goes in our food supply and our food system is right now we have the approach where there are all these environmental toxins, um, you know, red dyes, glyph- like pesticides, herbicides, you know, like things like this that are just PFOS, endocrine disrupting chemicals that are allowed. They're endemic in our food system. They're in our water, they're in our air, they're in like everything in the US. And you can't opt out of them. I contrast that to the way the FDA like regulates pharmaceuticals, where there are certain f- classes of pharmaceuticals. There's something called like right to try, where basically if you're really sick, you have the right to try experimental treatments and the like, where you yourself can choose to opt into them. Um, that seems like a good system to apply to the food system. And I, I think it's absolutely insane that most Americans are part of this hugely like unregimented, massive, you know, uncontrolled uh, clinical trial that is what happens to people when we introduce enormous amounts of toxins into our food system and give it to people to eat, you know, like for, so give it to everyone as an everyday part of their diet. Uh, and I, I think that this regulatory apparatus and framework is literally harming uh, and killing like millions, tens of millions of Americans uh, every decade. And it's why we have the sickest group of Americans we've ever seen in our entire lives. If you've been enjoying the Building Culture podcast and are listening on Apple or Spotify, could you pause for just a moment and leave a five-star review? My goal is to get to 100 reviews. And if you do, take a screenshot and email it to playbook at buildingculture.com. Playbook, P-L-A-Y-B-O-O-K at buildingculture.com. And when we hit 100, I'll randomly pick five winners and send them a Building Culture hat that looks just like this. I appreciate it. And back to the show. Yeah, that I want to talk about that here in in a minute. But you're so right that it's something that you're not able to opt out of, you know, in in my neighborhood, there's, you know, every other yards getting sprayed with, you know, these chemicals, you know, they come out four times a year to just spray a bunch of chemicals on the grass that my little kid, you know, we don't spray our grass, but that doesn't matter because everyone else is getting it sprayed and it's in the air, it's on the streets, it's in the water. And uh, it, like you're saying, like glyphosate is everywhere, which is basically banned in in, in Europe. And, and a lot of these chemicals too are, are like uh, derivatives of, of things from chemical warfare and things from World War II, from my understanding, right? Like it's, uh, I, I remember reading you know, we've gone through different versions of, say, pesticides in our food systems. And I forget what the the first one was, but I remember I think the second one was like DDT and then now we're on the neonicotoids or something. And of course, everyone is the safe one, you know, and then we do it and we're like, oh, crap, that one's not safe. And then we do DDT and we're like, oh, crap, that one's not safe. But what was mind boggling to me is they found in the North Pole, and I think the South Pole too, but I'm just going to use the North Pole, the highest concentrations of DDT in women's breast milk than like anywhere in the world, even though they've never, ever even like used an ounce of it there. And it's because it's used globally and then it, it condenses and, you know, evaporates into the air and moves north and moves. And then eventually when it gets to a place really cold, it no longer evaporates. And, and you're just like, oh my gosh, this stuff is serious. And it doesn't just have like these tiny localized consequences. It's a, uh, that's 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 pretty. Uh, it, it really is pretty wild. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's super concerning. I mean, if you look at uh, like a lot of the Inuit tribes and others that sort of live up in, around the you know, Arctic Circle, and like it, they they are finding some of the highest concentrations of forever chemicals like PFAS, polyfluoroalkyl substances, uh, in the blood and and sort of uh, intestines of and and other vital organs of of these tribes that have basically just been eating, um, you know, seafood. But now that everyone's seafood is contaminated practically all over the world and because yeah. all these chemicals have gone, you know, into the poles and into like our, our sort of weather systems up there, you have a group of people that has never made a Teflon pan or, you know, a, a sort of like plastic product polymer in their entire, you know, ancestry that is now getting decimated by 
these forever chemicals. It's just like, it's really sad. And I think that this toxicity and this like poisoning of damned American is going to be one of the defining issues of the next like 15 to 20 years. I, I completely agree. And on that note, let's let's talk about that a little bit. Like, let's talk about the state of health in the US because a lot of this stuff is not really widely known or talked about from what I can tell. You know, I mean, you point out in some of your articles, it's like 60% of Americans are living with at least one chronic disease, 80, 80% of Americans are overweight, 50% of teens are overweight. You know, can you talk about some of the, the the bigger statistics out there that are really on your mind that really concern you? I mean, there's a lot, but yeah, I mean, you you kind of hit on the on a couple of the biggest ones, but I like to me the some of the biggest concerns that I have are that today we have the sickest population of American adults that we've ever had, and if you look like the one that's really bad, like you know people just sort of accepted how it is. If we basically and and another thing I hear people talk a lot about is like the cost of healthcare. I think that the cost of healthcare is sort of this like false debate in a way where yes cost of healthcare is going up yes there's a lot of problems there but I, in my opinion the underlying reality is i would expect the cost of healthcare to go up like americans are sicker than we've ever been like i i basically don't expect or think that there's any way in which the cost of healthcare is going to be fixed while the health of the country stays on the same like horrible chronic disease treadmill that we're on currently uh like i i just don't think that you can you know, if, if you look, basically, um, if you look, basically, there's, you know, 80 plus percent of the all cost of healthcare uh, is tied to treating and managing chronic diseases. Uh, if we got chronic disease levels today, back to where they were in 1970, our cost of healthcare would go from being something like almost north of 20% of GDP to around like 4%. And like, that basically solves the healthcare crisis. If you just roll back the average American's health to 1970 levels, basically the levels at which our grandparents grew up. Uh, I think that that is like one, very, very concerning. Secondly, you look at today's crop of Americans, incredibly unhealthy. And what's worse is you look at the kids that today's generation of Americans are having and like kids have never before been as unhealthy as they are. You know, we're seeing record levels of, um, you know, adult onset, what used to be called adult onset diabetes. Um, because basically there were no records of children ever having this type of diabetes, like type two diabetes, uh, like, you know, pediatricians and doctors in the fifties and seventies could go their entire career without ever seeing a child with like type two diabetes. This is obviously no longer true. About 50% of, um, you know, of, of teens and under basically are overweight or obese, uh, rates of diabetes are skyrocketing. And for me, I think that the thing that is most concerning is that you know, is that we are effectively on a treadmill to have a population of Americans that are so physically unwell that they can't like do anything that I think probably you or I would view as life worth living. Like if, if you are sick all the time, if you're constantly fighting chronic disease, um, like it, it's just, it's just a, you're living a less healthy, less sort of joyous, less sort of uh, optimal life, in my opinion, than one that you could be. And I think that the fact that our food system and our regulators are robbing like hundreds of millions of Americans of living better lives, I just think is like an utter travesty. And unfortunately, it's one that seems as of today's trend lines to be just only getting worse. Yeah, the, the gosh, the, the cost of healthcare is utterly crazy. Like you're saying, it is plus 20, 20% of GDP. And, you know, I was reading recently because I was writing something, I was looking up the statistics of exact of diabetes and, and you know, 38 million, 38.4 or something million Americans have, have been diagnosed with diabetes and then another 97 million have pre-diabetes. And in 2022, we spent $413 billion just on the people that actually have diabetes. So yeah. 38 million people, meaning just if I do the math on that, you know, this is from the CDC too. I mean, like, so... I'm guessing that in, in within 10, 20 years, we're going to be spending a trillion and a half dollars yeah. on one chronic disease. And this is starting with kids and stuff too. I forget, isn't it a third? I don't know if this is true. I read this a long time ago, but something about a third of kids born after 2000 have, you know, are going to be diagnosed with diabetes, which I guess that makes sense because it's just yeah. so prevalent. Totally. And what the crazy thing is, it is one of the most preventable, or at least from my understanding, it's 
remarkably preventable through diet and, and things like that. <laughs> Completely. I mean, I, I think this is the thing that most people will argue is untrue that I just think they're wrong is I think that so like, I think that so many of the people that will say, you know, oh, diabetes, like obesity is genetic, diabetes is, you know, genetic, or any number of these things. Like, to my mind, there was a, like, for most of human history, these diseases have not been genetic. Like, why have these flipped genetic in the last 50 years, I think has to be like the question that you're asking many of these people. And why, if you look at, for example, Japanese Americans in the US, and compare that to them to Japanese people in Japan, you know, and see, oh, wow, Japanese Americans have obesity rates that are nearly five times the rate of Japanese Americans li- or Japanese living in Japan. You just have to go like, this clearly is not a genetic thing. This is like a disease of the environment. And if you look too at like, for example, zoo animals or something like this, you take zoo animals out of the wild, you put them in the zoo, you put them in an ancestrally inappropriate environment, and these animals start to gain weight. They start to have their hair fall out. They start to exhibit signs of like what is called zoocosis, which is literally a sort of catch-all term to to like designate the sort of coping mechanisms that wild animals uh, start to exhibit when they're held in captivity for a long period of time in an environment that is not the one that they're they're suited to. And I think that it is totally crazy to me to, to say that the record levels of chronic disease in a hugely ancestrally inappropriate environment, in a food system where you know 60% of the average American's calories are eating ultra-processed foods, it is 60%? Crazy. 60%. Um, it is crazy to me to look at this and go, oh, this is a genetic problem. Like it's yep. so obviously not. Uh, uh, yeah, that, that, that is baffling to me. And then you see people, you know, and it's not about like shaming people or something, but the idea of trying to like justify, for example, just an o- overweight or something, which you see culturally, you know, whether it's in celebrities and stuff like that, where it's, it's kind of like, cool or something to be overweight. And and I think that's a really damaging message. I don't mean it's about like making people feel bad, but also being like, this is not normal and it's not healthy either. Now it might not be your fault. Like it's not like you can do things about it, you know, but, but it's not, um, pointing the finger, but I think between, you know, I really connect, you're, you're talking about the environment and, and ancestry and heritage. And, you know, this is where it kind of really all ties together for me. Cause you know, where we work in the built environment and I really talk very similarly that you do about food um, and that the way we've been building, particularly over the past 60 years, and you can make an argument for really since World War II, but particularly in the past 60 years, we've been building in patterns and ways that are completely detached from all of human history. Now, I'm not saying we should go back and and build our cities exactly like Florence. Guess guess what? We have cars today and we have other things and other pieces of technology. But um, it's like this arrogance where we think we're at the pinnacle of all human civilization. And we know so much because like we've got microscopes or something now. And, um, and we do know a lot. That's what's, I mean, we really do know a lot, but in all our knowledge, we seem to know so little, like we've lost track of even the most basic truths, you know, cause I think about, you know, the other thing about Europe is not just the food, but the lifestyle is wildly different. Not just how much people are walking on a day-to-day basis, but how much people are interacting with each other on a day-to-day basis. Cause we've got, you know, our isolated suburban subdivisions. And if you're a kid and if you don't have friends, in the neighborhood, what are you going to do? The only time you can do anything is if your mom drives you somewhere, every play date, every sleepover, everything has to be so planned. And, you know, I recently read that the average teen spends almost five hours on social media per day, you know, and, and then we wondering like, why do people have anxiety and depression and suicide and and drug overdoses? And, and, um, it's like, well, we're setting everyone up for failure. So not only the lifestyle thing, and then like you're talking about with food where it's not just uh, you know, you mentioned, I think on your most recent newsletter, you were talking about, um, the, the, uh, uh, our mental health, like how our physical health really affects our mental health. And that's, there the really seems to be a lot of science coming out ab- about that now. Like Andrew Huberman is really big on that and talking about like, Hey, if you're feeling bad mentally, the best thing you can do is do something like hard physically. Yes. Um, can you talk about, you know, some of that connection between, you know, the, that, you know, about in terms of your, you, you know, your physical body health and your mental health and process and how those, you know, relate to each other? 
Yeah. So, so the way that I have been sort of like my evolving mental model, um, well, first off, I would say that this is definitely an ongoing area of research and inquiry. There's some really interesting books uh, coming out about it. Like Dr. Chris Palmer has written a book recently called Brain Energy, where he sort of argues that a lot of mental health disorders that we see today um, are, are metabolic disorders where of, of basically the brain. So whereas you can look at someone and say like, you know, you have, uh, you have obesity or you're exhibiting like X, Y, or Z symptom, those are sort of metabolic disorders that are manifesting where the symptom is obesity. His argument is that there's metabolic dysfunction that manifests as anxiety, epilepsy, ADHD, things like this, uh, which I think is very true. Like if, if you look uh, today, one of the best treatments for epilepsy, for schizophrenia is actually a very strict ketogenic diet like removing a bunch of sugars and processed carbs from someone's diet and then switching them to extremely low carb, um, you know, lo- no sugar, basically lower on processed foods uh, is, is truly one of the best treatments that we have for, you know, treating schizophrenia or, you know, it, like epilepsy is sort of like this class of diseases, mental health disease. That is kind of crazy. Like you, you hear that and you sort of are just like, oh, cool, that's great, you know, but it's wild that that the the best intervention, you know, after hundred years of, of Freudian and other psychology, is is not like talk therapy, is not CBT, is not any number of these things, or SSRIs it's, or whatever. Yeah, right. It's it's just like a straight up biological food based intervention. And my strong suspicion is that over the next twenty years, you know, we are going to see vastly more progress in this area of what people are calling metabolic psychiatry or metabolic psychology, um, which is this idea of addressing mental health disorders via food. We are going to see way more progress here than we are going to see in anything that resembles psychology, psychiatry, or any number of these sort of mental health um, disciplines. Like I think that you know we've had you know almost a hundred years of psychotherapy and stuff like this, uh, Skinner, Freud, you know Adler, and like all these sorts of types of um, psychologists and psychiatrists, and yet we still don't have a very strong model of if someone is depressed, what should they do? Yet we have very strong models today and we're, you know they're getting stronger for if someone needs to lose weight or you know uh, fix inflammation or any number of things we we pretty strongly know like a set of food interventions that we can conduct on or with an individual that will help them improve those different markers and i suspect that as we start to understand more about how you know the gut brain connection how like 80% of the serotonin and dopamine that is created in your body happens in the gut um, you know, if you get, wow, I did not know that. Yeah. percent did you say of the dopamine and what? And serotonin. Yeah. The, wow. That's created in your body is basically created in your gut. Um, the, the, like if, if you have, uh, there, there've been a bunch of studies that show when someone is dealing with like inflammation of the gut, uh, they also have more anxiety, more propensity to depression, things like this. Um, you know, like, I think that we are just on the cusp of starting to understand how important it is like how the body is truly this like one interconnected thing and and that it is impossible in my opinion to be or let me say not impossible but rare to be completely mentally healthy while living in a body that is like dealing with all sorts of physical and other ailments uh and i i think that if you are healthy if you get sunlight if you eat well if you feel good in your body it's exceptionally easier to be, you know, operate in a state of good mental health. Like I, I have like a two bad nights of sleep and, you know, I'm like have mental health problems and that like yeah. I'm a little more depressed, so I'm like easier and more angry, you know, <laughs> like people know that this is true just after experiencing a little bit of bad sleep or like a weekend of, you know, binge eating and drinking or whatever it is, like all the stuff that I used to do in college. Um, and, and I think that it's not a big leap for the average person to understand and go, oh, maybe actually what I'm eating all the time impacts how I feel on a day-to-day basis. Maybe my lack of exercise, my lack of mobility, my like, uh, you know, drinking too much or whatever, all of these play a huge role in my day-to-day mental health. And I, I think this is an area we're going to find out much more about in the next decade. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited about that. <clears throat> I've heard recently <clears throat> people referring to the gut as like the second brain, as second brain stuff, you know, and I haven't really read into that. But once again, like I was, the reason I was on bone broth and fermented foods and all that was because my stomach was so messed up and I just felt awful yeah. all the time. And so how did I deal with that? I dealt with that through diet was the best way I do. You know, I still constantly work on stuff and trying things to try to get um, 
healthier, you know, and what I love too about what you're saying, and I, I agree, I see this, this is kind of what I see is, you know, the past hundred years, we've really tried to simplify human beings into just like robots and, yep. and, you know, whether it was behavioral, uh, uh, psycho, you know, behavioral psychology and whatever, and, and just that, Hey, you know, people are just, you know, gears and microprocesses for brains and we can kind of control everything. Humans are just complicated. They're not complex. They're complicated. And we can really understand all the inner workings and we can just do this. Oh, we don't need a gallbladder. Just take it out. You know, we don't need a spleen. Just take it out. Um, we don't need tonsils. Just take it out. Um, and there seems to be, it still seems like a minority to me, but like a bit of an awakening there of just like, holy cow, humans are wildly complex. Um, and, and interconnected, like you're, you're saying. And I think that's a really exciting kind of area for science and all, because it's really kind of starting to blend, not just the hard sciences, but also, you know, I, I remember this study came out, I think it was this year, they were talking about the, the top treatments for depression. And of course, SR, yeah. SSRIs are like, way down here. What's up top? Dancing. Yeah. Dancing. It's like <laughs> statistically from like, this is a scientific study. And then there was like other, a couple other interesting ones up there. I was yeah. Like, it was like dancing, is- uh, weight training, yoga. It was, it yeah. was like 18 like lifestyle interventions and then like SSRIs all at the bottom. Yeah. And then in, in, like you're saying, talk therapy, that doesn't mean it's not helpful, but it, right. it's, there's so many other things ahead of that. And guess what? That are generally speaking cheaper. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was a really cool conversation with Justin. Um, gosh, there are <laughs> there are some big challenges facing us today. Um, but the exciting thing is we can do something about it. Um, and I hope that you got some actionable information out of this. And I will put more resources in the show notes. If you like the Building Port Culture podcast, if you liked this episode, please like, subscribe, and share. And on Apple and Spotify, if you could leave us a five-star review, it's really helpful. Thanks and catch you next time.